Let's open our Bibles this morning in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're going to look at the, uh, the last part of this chapter. This is a very difficult passage to read and to understand. And I'm just telling you, it is considered the pinnacle of the Gospel of Luke in regards to discipleship. Luke's Gospel has a lot of attention given to discipleship. Uh, in a, a few chapters just after this, there's a, a call to discipleship. We'll talk to the, about that in a moment. We'll look at that passage. But all throughout Luke, but this is the this is the center point of where Jesus really says, here is where the rubber meets the road. That expression meaning, here is where things really get serious. Here's the significant thing I want you to get about discipleship. And you're going to see uh, the words from our Lord Jesus will seem a little bit out of the ordinary to you uh, when you look compared to other things Jesus taught. This is very brash. Let's look at it together, beginning in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Three examples of somebody saying, I'll do it. One offering on his own, I want to follow you wherever you go. And he's calling on the other two, follow me, follow me. But in each one of the responses, it seems on the surface as though Jesus shoots them all down. I don't know about you, but let's be honest about the reading of this text. Does it sound as though there's a little bit of insensitivity on the part of Jesus with his replies to these people that we would probably otherwise think these were noble people offering to go where he went. It makes it very difficult to understand what's being taught here. Or am I alone in this? I mean, it does seem on the surface like this is being very bold and very candid and somewhat harsh. I mean, I would like to think if you're starting up something that any volunteer would be a blessing. I'll do it. If, if somebody is saying, well, I want to follow, but I want to first say goodbye to my family, you would think that's the kind of person I want on my team is somebody loyal to family. And how much more insensitive could you be when you've had someone who's died in the family and they say, I'll follow, but I've got this thing going on first. It's very important. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. And let me suggest to you this morning, by the way, while we're at this little question of, of how this appears, let me suggest to you that in no way, shape, or form, Jesus is calling on any of us to be insensitive or brash. There's something Jesus has. Jesus has something that you and I don't have. And when you read this passage, you need to remember this. Or you'll misinterpret the way Jesus is. Because I know you came here this morning with the idea that Jesus is full of compassion. Amen? Let's try that again. <laughs> Jesus is full of compassion. Amen? Amen? And I don't want you to leave here with anything less than that picture of what you came in here with. But here's the difference. Anytime you see Jesus 
making a statement like this, part of that is to grab attention. It's what we call a, a shock and awe effect. To snap people out of their lazy, apathetic way of thinking to get them to transcend to a higher standard of thinking. And he'll say something that kind of shocks you. And I think that's what's going on here too. <clears throat> Jesus, whenever asked questions, would hardly ever give the answer that was expected to be the answer. He always gave something that was uniquely different but was elevated beyond what you even thought the answer would be. Pharisees learned that the hard way every time they were trying to entrap Jesus because they didn't agree with what He was trying to do. They were jealous of His attention. And they would try to trap Him with a question. And more times than not, Jesus would turn the table with another question. But sometimes when He would give the answer, He would give an answer that totally threw them off their game of trying to entrap Jesus. Jesus was notorious for this. And so you need to understand something this morning. If you've missed anything in the sermon, please don't miss this point. Jesus in his offering the advice or his response or reply to these three particular individuals comes along with it the, idea, the, the fact that he knew their mind and their heart. And he knows his audience. He could read them because he knows even before they say anything, he knows what people are thinking. And that's the big difference between us and him. Because although I may think I can read your mind, I can't. And you have to know this. And I want you to know that I know this about you. That there is in no way, shape, or form in whatever problems or troubles you've been in or are in or will be in that I can say to you, I know exactly what you're going through because I don't. And you know that's true. And that's true of you and what you think of me. But that is not true of Jesus. Because when Jesus says, I know exactly what you're going through, He does. When he, know, when he says, I know exactly what you're thinking, He does. When He says, I know what you've been doing lately, He does. It's a little sobering, isn't it? It humbles you quickly when you realize, after all, in Acts 1, when they're choosing the person to replace Judas who has gone out to hang himself and now there's a vacancy in the apostleship among the twelve and they're about to cast lots, they pray to God, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. And they cast lots, they pray, they cast lots and Matthias is chosen. Lord knows the hearts of all men. And there's a wonderful story, one of my favorite miracle stories is Mark 2, when the paralytic is let down by four people when they dug through the roof because Jesus is in the house and there's no room for them to go in by the door. You remember this story? I share it many times. I think I've shared it recently. But there's that part where when Jesus perceived what the religious thinkers in that room that day were thinking, they weren't saying it. But the text says he knew what they were thinking. And guess what? He did. He knew what they were thinking. And what the text says they were thinking is, who can forgive sins but God alone? Because he had said to the paralytic after he was let down and laid down on the floor, son, your sins are forgiven. And they weren't saying this out loud, but perceiving he knew what they were thinking in their minds, he was able to address that. So that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he turns to the paralytic, rise, get your mat, and walk. And he did. He knows what these people are thinking. And there's some inner struggles that maybe on the surface you and I don't know about that Jesus is privy to. He knows there's some problems, some hang-ups here. This is very much com comparable to the Mark 10 story where the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus saying, uh, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, have you kept all these commandments? And he says to Jesus, yes, I've kept all of them since I was a young boy. And he says, one thing you lack. 
And I could just see the rich young rooter get the notebook out and pen and he's ready. What is, what is it? Show me, tell me what it is. The one thing. I'll get, it, I'll get it fixed. And Jesus says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. By the way, that's not an instruction that he gives to every Christian. But he gives it to this particular person. Why? Because he knows this person, this is where the hang-up is for this person. And the story ends up not being a happy ending because it says he went away sad for he had a lot of possessions. And Jesus was able to pinpoint the hang-up in that person. And let me say this before we go on and look at the rest of this text how it applies to the church today. He can pinpoint your hang-up too. You've come to church this morning, you've dressed up, you gave, you ate the Lord's table uh, emblems remembering and you've sang songs and you bowed your heads to pray, you even closed your eyes. Good for you, Jesus says, but there's something about you Jesus knows that maybe nobody else in this room would know. And he knows about your spiritual walk and what hang-ups you have. And he knows that major thing that may be keeping you from becoming or being the kind of disciple he's called you to be. You can put on a good show for us. I can stand here pretending that I've got it all together. And I don't. But I'm not about to share with you all the things that are wrong with me. But Jesus knows all the things that are wrong with me. And he knows all the things that are wrong with us as a church. That is our Lord. So this, is not, this is not a dialogue with these people that is meant to just be taken on the surface and say, wow, Jesus is cold to these guys. Jesus is trying to be challenging their thinking and it's in the text today, I think, to challenge ours. So here's the three things, three questions that I've considered while looking at this text. What possibly could be here that's challenging the thinking of his church today? Why does he want us to read this? Why, for example, in the first situation when a guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go, he's talking about foxes have homes and birds have nests. But I've got nowhere to lay my head. Well, one thing we can note about this from another account is that when another gospel writer speaks of this occasion, he's, he's specific about the guy who comes up to him as another teacher of the law. And being a teacher of the law, meaning that uh, when you go back to that day and time, teachers of the law like to kind of join themselves with other teachers of the law to have sort of a a status, promotion, or endorsement by fellow teachers, by fellow colleagues, as if we're part of the society and the more of the ones that are in the same business that I am, the more that I know and attach myself to, the better it is for me. Just knowing the fact that he's a teacher of the law who's coming up asking this or saying this and seeing Jesus' response is to me kind of making me think that Jesus knows that this guy thinks this is going to be personal gain for him if he follows me. Because this guy's able to see there's a lot of people following Jesus. Jesus is in the time still of popularity. He's not in that obscurity zone yet. He's not in that rejection zone yet. He's got crowds following him. And they're thronging him. And they have been with him. Just like in Mark 2, they're, they're in that packed house when he's healing the paralytic. He's a pretty popular guy. And if I'm in the same business as Jesus is in, I want to know Jesus. And I want Jesus to know me because that advances my own personal goals. And Jesus is saying something to him that will challenge his thinking. If you're in this for personal advancement, you've got the wrong idea because I'm not going home to Hilton tonight. I don't even know. I don't have reservations. I don't even know where it is I'm going to close my eyes at. Foxes know where their home is. Birds have nests. I'm going until it's time for me to lay down and sleep, and I don't know where that's going to end up at. And Jesus is trying to convince this guy 
who wants to follow that it's not quite as easy as you think it is or as it appears to be. Following me is not going to be easy. And that's the message for the church today. And so the question is, will we as a church choose comfort over the cross? Because following Jesus means you choose the cross. And following Jesus has nothing to do with you being personally advanced among your peers. It has nothing to do with endorsing you and giving you more status position. As a matter of fact, following Jesus might mean that you would by social standards be lowering yourself when you're stooping down and you're touching the untouchables like lepers and you're eating in the homes of tax collectors and sinners and what Jesus starts getting criticized for, are you really serious about following me wherever I go? Because this guy says, wherever you go, and Jesus is saying, do you know where that's going to be? When you think about all the places Jesus went, are you really all that gung-ho about following where he went? Do you remember the path to the cross? Are you willing to go there? You see, if we're willing to choose the cross, then the answer is yes. But there's nothing comfortable about that. That cross does not have a padding on it. There's no buffer between that cross and your bare back. Think about what Jesus has called a discipleship is. As a matter of fact, mark your place here. Let's turn quickly over to Luke 14. Just toward the end of that, where we're looking at verse 25 of Luke 14, where it says, Large crowds are traveling with Jesus. Again, we've got popularity going on. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me, and by the way, is this not what's happening here at the end of John uh, Luke 9? People are coming up to Jesus. And he says, if anyone comes to me here and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Wow. And whoever does not carry their cross, and follow me cannot be my disciple. This is all about the cost of discipleship. So will we as a church choose comfort or will we choose the cross? And maybe you've been in a third world country and maybe you have been in places where people are not as affluent as we are in our society. I, I heard the other day a statistic that the average American lives on $90 per day, and 90% of the world lives on less than $2 a day. We might, think, we might not think of ourselves being rich, but we are. You go to India, you go to Nepal, you go to Africa. When we go to Ecuador next summer, I know we're going to see people living in poverty. And I know we talk about Blackwell being in a, 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 a town with a low uh, economy. We have poor people here, but the poorest of the poor here are richer than the majority of the world. We really are. And we are creatures of comfort, aren't we? We like comfort food. We like comfortable pews. We like comfortable temperature in the rooms, in our houses, in our church buildings. And sometimes the things that I have been myself complaining about, and I know you've complained about too, are trivial when compared to the boy in Nepal who may not even make it to his eighth birthday. More than 50% of kids in Nepal don't make it to the age of eight. And we're talking about this pew is too hard, or this uh, church van is too bumpy, or all the other things that you and I might complain about today and Jesus is just shaking his head. You know, you're complaining more than foxes or birds do. You're, 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 you're not looking at the whole situation. We're choosing comfort over the cross sometimes. 
Here's the second question I would ask as we're looking at this, especially from when he goes to verse 59 and says to another man, follow me. I'm back in Luke 9 now. But he says, well, let me first go bury my father. And he says, let the dead bury their dead. And I wish I could tell you I know exactly what he means there by that statement, but I don't. But I do know that the application for the church is this. Will we choose as a church maintenance over mission? There's some things I've got to take care of first. That's an important thing to take care of, in my opinion. But Jesus, knowing the heart of this person, knows that maybe this is just a smoke screen. Maybe he just wants to sound good. It's kind of like maybe when we see... Uh, I always get this confused. I'll have to look. Is it Ananias and Sapphira or Aquila and Priscilla? I have forever wrestled with the story of those two couples. Okay, so let's say it this way. Remember the couple that sold their land and didn't give all the proceeds, laid it at the apostles' feet? You know the ones I'm talking about. Okay? We'll just change it to modern day names. It was uh, uh, Harley and Irene, okay? Harley and Irene. I mean, after all, who names their kids Sapphira or Ananias or Aquila Priscilla anyway, right? But Harley and Irene. But they kept back part of the money. But they're saying it was all of it. And Peter says, you've lied to the Spirit. And they dropped dead, one after the other. They were thinking, this makes us look good. If we do what others we've seen doing, this will make us look good. Let's do this. But they're... But God knows what's in their heart. And I, I think Jesus at this point knows what's in this person's heart. And therefore, he's challenging the statement, the excuse that he says, I've got to bury the dead first. Jesus is pointing out something to him. Will you choose maintenance over mission? God's called us to be mission-minded. That's why in the church today, we shouldn't just be interested in just keeping our own, holding our own, making sure everything is still running smoothly and putting out just fires here and there. We've got to be more proactive about our church growing than just trying to maintain what we've got. As we've been hearing in the training modules each month, we heard last month, you will never grow the church by the people you already have. You can only grow the church by the people you don't have yet. And it takes mission vision to reach those people. Will we choose maintenance over mission? And the third and final one is this. And it comes from this following, uh, this, this last following statement in verse 61. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. And I think the question for the church today is this. Will we choose indecisive minds over undivided hearts? I'll do this, but i got to go do this over here first. There's distractions all around us that Satan will keep throwing into your path. How many of you have great goals? Best goals. Best plans you've ever devised in your life, but somehow you can't seem to get them executed. You can't go through with them because all these things, you're chasing rabbits. How many of you have thought, and in my, you know, this recently, and by the way, I'm in Hawaii next month. But about six months ago, I'm thinking, it sure would be nice to be 50 pounds lighter. And I had great plans. But what I kept telling myself is, well, i got to wait until this event happens. Then I'll start. But then that happens, right? And there's something else on the calendar. Well, I can't start fasting yet. We've got that fellowship, man. We've got this thing going. We've got that thing going. And I'll wait until just... And I couldn't be running because it was too cold in the winter or walking and doing outside. I'll wait until it warms up. When it warmed up, guess what? It was too wet. I'd be swimming. <laughs> For here... I had all kinds of distractions, but sometimes I think we hide behind these other things that we got to take care of first, and indecision leads to inactivity. You know that, don't you? Indecision leads to inactivity, and inactivity leads to death. It really does. Atrophy will set in, and you'll die because you're not working, you're not exercising, you're not being active, and that happens to us spiritually. 
And we got to choose undivided hearts that set on mission because we're focused on the cross instead of settling for the comfort and maintaining what we've already got with indecision that leads to inactivity that leads to death. And there's the sermon. By the way, in Matthew's account, there's something that kind of correlates to this principle I'm referring to. Another spot where you might say, wow, that's kind of insensitive on the part of Jesus. It's in Matthew 12, verse 46. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my, my brother, my sister, and my mother. Let me tell you something. Jesus loved his mother. Jesus loved his brothers. But he wasn't worried about his mother or his brothers. He knew where they'd be eternally. He was worried about the crowd he was dealing with, his disciples, getting them trained right. He would not allow an indecisive mind to divide his attention. To go deal with that at the moment. To him it was more important to his cause to stay focused on training his disciples. A lot of things are going to trip us up. A lot of things that will distract us. A lot of things that will try to beat you down. And Jesus is asking which will you choose? Think about how spoiled we are. And think about the world that needs Jesus. You've heard the gospel how many times in your life? Think about the person that has never heard the gospel. But we're comfortable here hearing it for the 32,646th time rather than thinking about how I might share it with one person that's never heard it before. And that's not discipleship. The discipleship costs more than that. And Jesus paid the ultimate cost so that you and I could even be a disciple. This morning we're going to extend an invitation for anybody who wants to start following Jesus. But he wants you to know there's a cost to it. It is not easy, and it's not comfortable. But if you're willing to take up the greatest challenge in the world, and that is to share the gospel with the world, and you're willing to follow Jesus, and Jesus has your heart, and you're willing to pick up that cross, won't you do that this morning? And if you're struggling with some distractions, some things that have gotten you down, let's take that to Jesus while together we stand in some